this December 7th through 9th. Check out the Ed Up Experience podcast live and in person in Doha, Qatar for the World Innovation Summit on Education. We will be documenting the ideas and innovations from today's most influential global education leaders. Check them out at wise-qatar.org and follow the EdUp Experience podcast for more information. Yay! Guys, this is Joe just popping in to ask if you've signed up for your free marketing consultation with MDT Marketing yet. If you haven't, head to mdtmarketing.com slash edup, submit your information, get your free consultation today. Don't do it alone. Find the right partner. Welcome back, everybody. This is the EdUp Experience podcast, where we make education your business. My name is Dr. Joe Salustio here again, your host. I'm very excited to be here with you again as we talk to another college and university president. We have pa- well past 100 college and university presidents that we've interviewed, and uh, we've <laughs> we've gathered lots and lots of information. And I laugh because my you'll find my guests ask me, "What'd you learn?" And I said, "Oh gosh, we learned we learned that everybody's doing something. That's what we learned. Everybody's got something going on as a college president, uh, something to keep you up at night and something to keep you coming back the next day. And that's going to be a question I asked my guests today, but we'll get to that in a second. Along with me, I have brought kicking and screaming, if you will, my co-host today, Dr. Bill Pepicello. That Bill, that's for you and your knowledge. You. I, and I appreciate that, Joe. I thought the gong would be appropriate. Very nice. Thank you very much. I've worked all day on that. I said, how do I bring a sound that properly says Bill Pepicello? And this is what it... What do you think? I'll take it. I've had worse. Okay. I I was going to originally go with this here. Bill Pepicello. But, you know, it didn't didn't sound right. So anyway, I think I picked the right one. That's right. All right. Well, we're we're, uh, very excited to bring in our guest. He's president of Washington and Jefferson College. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Knapp. Look at that, John. They can't, they're just not stopping for you. I don't even know how to turn them off here. I just, they, they won't stop. There we go. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for including me. I don't get applause very often these days, so it's nice to be on the program. The crowd literally would not stop, uh, John. So thank you for coming on. So much going on at Washington and Jefferson College. I, you know, um, I I will say I got tons of questions, but I thought a good starting place for us is always, you know, talk to us about Washington and Jefferson College. What do you do and how do you do it? Yeah, Washington and Jefferson is usually referred to, at least by those who know it, as W&J. And we are a 240-year-old institution, one of the oldest colleges and universities in the country, literally founded in the latter days of the American Revolution, at that time on the frontier of the country, which was other side of the Allegheny Mountains um, in what's now Pittsburgh. And so today... Uh, We're very much a part of the thriving Pittsburgh region, but when we were founded and for many years thereafter, we were sort of on that edge of the American frontier as the country began to expand westward with the acquisition of the Ohio Territory and the college played an important role then as it does today in preparing professionals to serve communities and society in important roles and also preparing graduates to be good citizens of a country that requires citizens to be responsible stewards of our democratic institutions. Any Steelers fans over there at uh, WNJ? One or two. Yeah. One or two. I was going to say Eagles, but I didn't want to embarrass anyone. Well, uh, we have Eagles fans here. Our head football coach, Mike Seriani's younger brother is the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. So we have a lot of people over here cheering for the Eagles these days, just out of support for Mike and his brother. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Hey, small world. It's true, right? I want to. It is a small world. I want to start by picking out a statistic that is sitting on your website for all to see, and it was. It's one of those stats that I find. I go, okay, how the what the you know, and it's your ninety eight percent of W and J graduates who complete their education in four years. The reason why I think that's so uh, 
astounding is because we know if you work in higher education at the gra- undergraduate level, typically the national average is somewhere like five and a half to six years uh, for a four-year degree. How do you get it at 98%? What, what do you have going on? Can you share all of your secrets? In fact, just say secret number one, secret number two, and keep going until we get all of the, all the juicy details. Well, I don't think there are any trade secrets involved. I think it really is a matter of being very focused on each and every student's success. We can do that with a essentially a nine to one student faculty ratio, a small college where when we promise that every student is known by name and your, your professor will know if you're not in class, um, that's very much the case here. And so for someone to fall through the cracks here um, is more unusual perhaps than it would be at a larger institution where um, you have large lecture halls and where perhaps professors are not as attuned to, to how their students are doing individually. But maybe more importantly, um, we're, we have a four-year graduation guarantee, meaning if it takes you more than four years and you follow the, the uh, academic advice that you've been given about the courses you need to take and you keep those courses and pass them, you'll finish in four years. And if for some reason uh, the college were ever unable to provide you with a course that you needed, say in your last semester and you, re- you had to stay longer, then that would be on us. But that really doesn't happen. We make sure that the courses are available when students need them. A lot of times at, at universities where people stay for five years to complete a four-year degree, it's a function of not having the courses you need in the sequence that you need them at the time that you need them. That's not the case here. Yeah, that is, that's critical, right? It's, it's kind of one of those things that you don't know till you look under the hood when you think about colleges and universities and how they sequence the courses. Sometimes something's not offered. It just keeps you there longer. You have to wait till it cycles around again. And, and that's a really good point. And Bill, I'm going to come to you just in a second, but I have to ask one more. And that's, that's about the leadership uh, stance that your college, uh, W&J, takes. Uh, social justice, environmentalism, sustainability, entrepreneurship. There's a lot of future leadership terms and terminology there for a, a world um, that we're living in that, that where a lot of those things like social justice, it's a focus. Um, it's, uh, it's an important focus. We've seen racial divides. We've seen poor communication. We've seen environmentalism. We've seen climate change, all these things going on around us. How do you prepare the leaders of the future? Yeah, leadership has been a focus of the college literally from the beginning. The founders in those early days understood that educated people were going to be the leaders of communities in this newly independent nation. And we've really uh, continued to follow the mission that the college was given in the very beginning. We have a commitment that our graduates will not only be leaders, but they'll be ethical leaders. And we have a a four-year program that is designed to give students every opportunity to develop their leadership capacities, but also to learn how to think and to and to act in a way that champions the highest standards of ethics in their communities and their future professions as well. And that's a distinctive of W&J. Our mission statement um, has a phrase that has been time honored that says that we graduate people of uncommon integrity. And so for us, leadership has to be ethical leadership to be consistent with the mission of the college. Speaking of uncommon integrity here, I'd like to bring you in, Bill. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Stop that. I, I want to change direction just a, a little bit, if I might, John, um, because with the you know the the small student to faculty ratio, and I think I also um, read that you have a practicum as part of your curriculum. I, I was wondering how COVID impacted um, life at Washington and and Jefferson over the last uh, year, 18 months. Yeah, in some ways, I imagine that the impact here was felt in a way that you would find at most institutions. We all responded in ways that we thought were most appropriate to our own settings. As a four-year residential college, and I will mention that we do have a four-year residency requirement, which is unusual today for an undergraduate college, but um, we recognize that um, we're a community where people live in close quarters and interact very closely with one another, that sort of academic intimacy that we talk about. Um, with COVID, that had to change. And so um, just to give you a little um, kind of background on how this college navigated the crisis that frankly continues in many ways, 
Um, you know, Bill, with your background with a large university with online courses, you'll appreciate that um, in March 2020, Washington and Jefferson College had never taught a single online course. Wow. And we literally, on a week's notice, had to close the campus, send everybody home, all the students, faculty, the staff, everybody had to work remotely. And we gave the faculty one week to take all the courses that were then in progress and to retool those and to continue through the end of the semester teaching them remotely. Um, that was a huge undertaking. I'm tremendously proud of our faculty for their ability to step it up and adopt new teaching methods and get through the end of the semester, graduate our class on time, make sure the students finish the classes they started. And then over the summer of uh, 2020, our faculty went through more significant training in how to uh, teach remote students effectively. We invested a lot in new technology and we made a policy that we would de-densify the campus so that we would have single occupancy rooms only, meaning no roommates. And so about half of our students would be on campus and half would be studying remote. We gave them the option actually, and it turned out that um, it sort of divided out fairly evenly. That meant that every class that we taught had students who were synchronously in real time um, learning both in the classroom and remotely on a screen with technology in the classroom to allow those remote students to join us. Um, it was quite a year. We continued that through the full year. Um, not an experience that um, really fits with the model of education we provide, which is that very close in-person experience, but it allowed our students to persist on, on track to graduation. It allowed us to keep the campus safe and to avoid any significant um, outbreak of disease that might cause us to shut down. And, and this year we have everybody back. We're all back on campus. We're still requiring masks. We have a vaccination requirement for all students, faculty and staff. And, uh, and we're moving along, continuing to navigate the pandemic. But I think college is a lot more fun this year with everybody on campus and more of the activities available that frankly had to be curtailed during last year's time of caution. Wow, that is that is a remarkable story. Um, Joe, before I throw it back to you again, um, John, could you tell us a little bit about um, the practicum part of your curriculum and, and how that might have been impacted? Yeah, it's actually a new requirement. Many of our students had been doing practical learning through internships, um, lab work, um, through um, say, you know, work, working say uh, an arts major with uh, developing their own talent through uh, uh, a creative product, for example. But the faculty decided last year that they would um, introduce a new requirement that every student would have a, a rigorous supervised practicum as a graduation requirement. And that that practicum would be designed in a way that um, aligns with their future professional interests with the understanding that it's important not only to, to demonstrate what you know, but what you know how to do and what you've done um, by getting some good hands-on experience in an area related to your field. Uh, most of our students were unable to do that kind of work in the last year. I imagine that's true everywhere. Um, internships really weren't available, um, except some that some students did online where that was possible. But you know, employers weren't inviting people into the workplace during last year very much. Uh, we continued to do lab work with students. We do a lot of um, faculty student collaborative work in the laboratory, but that was available to students who were on campus, not those who were remote. So it definitely had an impact on students' ability to, to get that hands-on experience that they need. I find that particularly uh, interesting. Um, Joe, you won't know anything about this because you were might maybe not even born, but probably in grade school. But uh, practical were, were a very large part of many uh, institutions in the 70s and the 80s. <clears throat> and they sort of went out of, uh, of fashion. Um, University of Phoenix brought them back. Um, you can imagine uh, the issues that arose when we had several hundred thousand students who were all looking for a required practicum. Um, all around the country that led to some interesting challenges. Uh, and now um, the, the whole notion of, of practica seems to be coming back again as, uh, as higher education tries to 
renew its relationship with, uh, with, with the business world. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very interesting to see this, this cycle coming back. Yeah, that's well said, Bill. I think that's exactly what's happening. And it's it's really all of us being responsive to the needs of employers and the growing expectation that students need to have some portfolio of experience that they bring with them. Yeah, I, I, I know a little bit about that, Bill. So I'm gonna, that's that, I know a little bit about practicum. Uh, but but I will tell you that it's certainly evolving more, um, uh, evolving more toward the world of work. And before we go there, before we go there, I am going to ask you the keep it on your toes question. John, are you ready for this? I hope so. Bill told me to hit that button just for the record to get you ready for this. John, if there was a, a, a entrance music song playing every time you walked into the room at WNJ College, what song would be playing? Yeah, I can't even think of one offhand. Okay, I, we'll come I back would to the prefer end. it not be the gong that you've been playing for Bill. That might be taken the wrong way. There it is. It's going to keep coming every time. Every time we hear Bill's name from now on, I'm going to hit the gong. All right, John, we're going to give you the end of the episode to figure it out. Right now, we're going to give you the incorrect, but hopefully we'll give you the correct button later in the episode when you think about it. Be careful what you select, John, because there's a chance that your staff will be playing this tomorrow or, or after they hear this episode that may be playing every time you walk into the room. So choose wisely, my friend. Um, I want to take us back around to what Bill was talking about. Um, <laughs> Bill, I got to tell you, you know, you're such a good sport <clears throat> and you're giving me a little stuff about my age, which is great because... I was going to give you a little something about your age when, when John was talking about the institution. How many years old was it, John? 240. Uh, yeah, I was going year. to say just one, just about the same age as Bill. But, but yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't know how you'd feel about that, Bill. But since you're giving me a hard time, I thought, you know, I'm going to bring it back. <laughs> See, that's why we have such a good relationship. Absolutely. John, I, I do want to take Bill's line of questioning a little bit. And you you go online you're f proud of your faculty they they deliver online now you're going back to what i think is a big value proposition for w and j which is on ground resident courses what do you do with the online stuff that you built the 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 knowledge the assets the experience itself do you put it away in a closet and wait to bring it back out do you keep it rolling talk to me about how your your um you and your leadership team think about online learning now as a complement or supplement or or a bolt-on talk about how you use it as a strategic tool or, or if at all yeah i think for us we learned some things one thing we learned is that um, we don't need to be in the business of trying to compete with southern new hampshire and arizona state and a lot of places that um, specialize in online courses for adult learners primarily uh, we teach undergraduate students. We believe that a four-year in-person experience um, really creates that formative kind of development that allows a student to go from uh, traditional age, late teens to early adulthood, and to be fully mature and ready for life. We don't think that can really be done um, through online education in the same way. It's, it's um, you know, there's a niche for what we do, and and there's a place for online. That said. Uh, we have learned that uh, our summer sessions, we have two summer sessions, which we offered online, are very popular with students um, in that format. They've traditionally been in person. Now, um, as of 2020, we're offering classes in the summer online. I imagine that'll continue because those students are at home. Many of them have, have summer jobs. Um, they'd like to pick up a course and keep pace for graduation. Um, they can do it from home now. And so I think the the summer sessions will probably be our our online offering in most cases. There may be some other exceptions, but um, that would be mostly up to the faculty if they chose to go that direction. I think there's just a lot of strong buy-in here to this idea of a college where we have a 24 seven developmental experience that's very, very um, uh, well-crafted over many years. And we believe in the results we get from doing it that way. If you're experiencing any level of marketing challenge right now, you've got to ask the hard questions and you need answers. Are you using the right mix of channels to get in front of your future students? Is your messaging personalized and delivered in a medium your audience and future students will respond to? And are you spending more time building reporting 
than listening in on what your students really want. All of these questions will get answered when you sign up for your free consultation with MDT Marketing. Head to mdtmarketing.com slash edup, submit your information, and talk to MDT. Don't go it alone. Find the right partner. The guys at MDT, the team at MDT is absolutely amazing. Whether it, your challenge is the cost of inquiries, your melt, your branding, the bad and incomplete information that come with your inquiries, whatever it is, an audit of your challenges will help your institution and it's free. mdtmarketing.com slash add up. You know, it's really uh, interesting times because now... It used to be, Bill, and you know this, a couple years ago, two, three, five years ago, maybe a little bit longer, online learning was part of a value proposition. It was, it was hey, we have online learning, we have, we're giving courses online, adult students, whatever. Now, because so many schools have gone online, it's it's like a reverse value proposition, John, and, and coming back to, you know, it's a, it's a value for to communicate to the traditional student that this is an on-ground experience. It's, it's about the experience, the formative years, the, the friends and the family and the struggles and the successes, and you're going to just mold yourself as a person when, when it's, it's a, a part of a niche now. Um, catering to a specific part of the higher education spectrum. Do you see it that way from a marketing perspective that this is a really well, unique model? I do. I think that that there is actually a, an important place for colleges in our category. I also think that COVID has reinforced for many people that um, this is a great way to live and learn. Anybody that was thinking that colleges like ours would be replaced by online courses um, probably had to think, you know, have second thoughts about that after the experience that we've had during COVID. I think many high school students, for example, that um, found them, their, uh, themselves relegated to online classes and missed out on all the opportunities of being a part of a school community, um, they are not looking for colleges where they can take online classes. They're looking for a place where they can have a college experience in person and make friends in the traditional way. So, if anything, the experience with online learning, especially for our prospective students, has convinced them that uh, they want an in-person education even more than ever. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, that we learned surprisingly at University of Phoenix was that uh, we would put facilities up across the, uh, the country where online students were invited to come in and meet with staff or do financial aid. Uh, and various kinds of transactions, and they flocked to it. Mm. And one of the things they told us was, well, the fact that, that we want to take our classes online doesn't mean that we don't want person-to-person, high-touch interaction. Uh, we, we see it as is all part of, of an ecosystem. And uh, that took us quite by surprise. Well, it makes perfect sense, really. I think human beings are wired to be social animals. We want to be with other people and they bring out the best in us in the right situations where we've crafted a community designed to do just that. And this is a community where um, the design of everything that we do with our students is um, to help them advance toward full adulthood, to realize their full potential, um, to have the opportunity to leave here, um, not just work ready or career ready, but we, we talk about our graduates have to be professionally ready. So professional readiness is the mantra here. That means that we want our graduates to be a cut above other college graduates in terms of their, their maturity, their, their self-confidence, the polish that they bring to a job interview, the, the demonstrated competencies that they have, and the fact that they're a person of character that other people recognize as someone who's, who is respectable and who has the capacity ultimately to be a good leader and hopefully get the first promotion. And would you say that's where the liberal arts platform comes in in, in adding value uh, at your college? Oh, well, absolutely it does. We, we are committed to the idea that the most complex problems that we face in the world, take COVID for example, don't lend themselves to simple solutions through a single disciplinary lens. Yes, COVID is a public health problem. It's also a public policy problem. It's a political problem and sociological problem. 
um, that, that that's a logistical problem. Um, there's there's an any number of ways that we can sit and and uh, examine this pandemic by thinking in the round and bringing different lenses to bear to better understand um, the nature of the problem we face. That's what we do in the liberal arts. We teach students how to apply these um, various lenses to examine things critically and to see in, in a uh, more fulsome way the, the true complexity of the challenges that, that they need to learn how to address. So I think a liberal arts education um, is probably more relevant than ever to a lot of employers who understand that um, you need people who know how to learn and who can can continue to learn and think critically. The world's changing fast and somebody who graduates from a program with a finite set of skills, but, but without the ability to um, continue to take in new knowledge and make sense of it um, is going to get left behind. So we, you know, we very much believe in that and have um, for many generations at this college. And in a sense, a lot of what we hear from employers is that some of the time-honored approaches to learning that, that have been a part of this college's um, toolkit for generations are maybe more relevant than they've ever been. I couldn't agree more. Uh, let me follow up on that just before I throw it back to you, Joe. I, uh, I want to take it one, one more step. Uh, one of the things that I'm sure you don't know about me, John, is that I am a liberal arts person. Um, my uh, bachelor's degree is in classical languages and my master's and PhD are in linguistics. Couldn't People think of anything more exciting. And some people are always astounded to find out that the president of University of Phoenix has that kind of a background. But I know that. <laughs> Stop that, Joe. I know that you, on, you have a unique perspective on the liberal arts and the world of work. Um, I, I believe you have a, a multi-volume work on the business of higher education. And I'd be interested if you could give us a, a little background on, uh, uh, on what that's all about. Yeah, well, my own background is very much in the humanities. My, my field is religion and uh, through that applied ethics, professional ethics, which is what I've taught at other institutions prior to becoming a college president at another liberal arts college um, before coming here. So it's very much my, um, you know, my approach to things is through the lens of the liberal arts, the humanities, um, as you describe. Um, what was your question about that? I'm interested in how that plays into your work on the business of higher education. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I also have a, a background in business. Uh, I actually was in consulting for about 10 years before I um, moved into the professoriate. It's a long story, but... Um, but I think we understand that in today's world, it's probably more important than ever for us to recognize that colleges and universities are businesses, that they have to be savvy about understanding marketing, about how to manage their finances well, how to make good business plans and budgets at a time of declining national enrollment where we have um, fewer uh, there's, I would say, a smaller margin for error for many institutions. We have to to use good business sense and how we manage. Um, and the question that we asked when we put together the three volumes was, um, you know, are we in the business of higher education or are we in the higher education business? And I think being in the business of higher education means that we're in higher education, but, but it does require us to think um, in a savvy manner like good business people should about um, how we, you know, how we ensure that these institutions, this one that survived for 240 years, we want to make sure this institution continues to fulfill its mission for another 240 years. And that means um, making good use of the resources we have, investing well, um, budgeting wisely, marketing in a savvy way that differentiates the college and is clear about um, why somebody should find our value proposition attractive. Um, all the same things that any successful business um, needs to be able to do well. And I think for many years, um, higher education lived in a more forgiving marketplace where we had growing numbers of students going to college every year, really up until about maybe 11 years ago in this country. After World War II, we had 
decades of enrollment growth, which allowed colleges to be a little bit sloppy about how they managed at times and still get away with it because there were plenty of students to go around. We're in a decade of long of declining enrollment now, especially in our part of the country. Um, we can't afford to not think and act in a savvy business manner. So, you know, that also means that, that uh, we have to educate other people within the institution about some of the business realities of why we make decisions the way we do, why, why resources um, get allocated as they do. We are much more transparent and inclusive and collaborative now in our budget um, in our budget development than we might have been in decades past, but we try to involve the whole college in understanding uh, what we have available in resources, how budget decisions are made, give people opportunity to have input in that process. Um, not everybody gets everything they want, but it's very important for us to all be very much aware that the business realities um, are front and center in a highly competitive marketplace where the, the pie is shrinking, we all want the same amount of pie, but the pie is smaller today than it was a decade ago. And, and we're aware that in our part of the world, uh, the number of college going traditional college age students will be um, in continuous decline until around 2037. Yeah, it's, you, that's the mic drop moment of the episode. You said so much there that is so important for, for administrators, uh, operators alike. That realization that you talked about the business side is so critical to understand because it does f help you form your strategic plan. You know, if you're gonna be in a highly competitive marketplace, you have to have the right assets in place to communicate the value proposition so that you can stay in front of the hearts and minds of potential students. One way that uh, I noticed and one unique way that you guys do that is through the Magellan Project. I was hoping you could talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, when I was an undergraduate back in the 70s, don't play any music for that right now. Um, but, you, you, you get a, you get a get out of jail free card there. I won't do it. Yeah, but anyway, I, I, uh, you know, if I had met someone at my university who had studied abroad, I would have thought that was the most exotic thing in the world. I didn't know people who had as college students had had the chance to leave the country on, on some kind of a travel course or something. Well, that's changed. And today there's an expectation when students are looking at colleges that part of your education will be a chance to have an international experience. Um, one of the roadblocks to that international experience in many cases is that it can be costly. Um, and so at WNJ, we have a program that we call the Magellan Project which allows individual students to custom design or handcraft an international experience that they would like to have, say they might want to conduct research in Ghana um, on public health. And they design a proposal with the help of faculty and they present that proposal. And if the proposal is approved, the college funds that experience for the student. Uh, that's made possible through the generosity of donors who believe in this opportunity for students to have these very individualized, focused international experiences. And so we're really blessed with good philanthropy from donors that wanna make it possible. And our students have this chance to literally travel abroad on their own and come back having learned something that no one else in the world has ever had the chance to do. That's amazing. I love it. I, I love the crafting piece of that. I think that students are so, involved now in the way they want to experience education. I think it's a big uh, a part of how the students evolved over the years too, just wanting to be kind of in control of, of their experiences a little bit. Bill, you have any more questions for John before I give him the final two? No, I don't think so. I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I would have hit the applause button for some of the responses that, uh, that John gave us. As Joe, you know that my, uh, my perspective on um, all of, higher education now and, and the relationship between academics and the world of work is that every academic decision is a business decision and every business decision is an academic decision. So this, uh, John, that, what, what you had to say has been music to my ears. Uh, thank you for that. So well, thank you, Bill. Take it away, Joe. All right, John, we asked uh, our every guest the last two and final questions. Here they are. Number one, what did we miss about WJ College that you want to say? Anything that Bill specifically didn't ask you? 
I mean, I tried to prep him in advance, but you know, you can, <clears throat> there's only so much you can do here. Yeah. So anything that Bill forgot to ask you? And number two, what is the future of, co- of higher education going to look like? Well, the first one's a lot easier than the second, of course. Um, in terms of the first question, I think we covered a lot of what I had hoped to cover, which is that we understand that it's important when students have as many good options as they have, and they certainly do in today's market, especially, it's very much a kind of a buyer's market for people looking for traditional um, undergraduate education. So more important than ever to have a distinctive place to stand, to be visible from a distance, um, to be a college that people look at and say, you know, I'm going to pass 30 other colleges along the highway to get there, but it's worth the trip because what I want is only available at WNJ. That's really the holy grail for all of us in, in liberal arts education is finding the way to, to make sure that what we're offering is understood to be distinctive, not readily available elsewhere, um, and worth crossing a few state lines to get to because it's just that good. Um, I believe that that's what WNJ offers. I think our our approach to four years of development to ensure that you're professionally ready, um, that that notion of professionalism is a higher standard that uh, means our graduates are recognized as top talent for not only leading employers, but the best graduate programs, um, the opportunity for them to spend four years as well, developing their leadership potential and becoming a person who's recognized as not just a leader, but a leader who champions high ethical standards in communities and society and workplaces, professions. Um, those are things that families value. They understand that ultimately, when you graduate from a good college, you're going to get a job. But are you going to be the sort of person who can look in the mirror and recognize that you truly have realized much of your God given potential and that others will recognize you as somebody that they really? Would desire to have as a part of what they're doing and so we believe that our our approach to professional readiness with that focus on ethical leadership is truly a distinctive of the college it's also true that as a liberal arts college we don't allow people here to just study in one area i just just had a group of visiting students on campus on friday with their families you know high school students and I said, you're all in high school. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have been asked what you're going to major in in college? They all raised their hands. I said, first of all, it's the wrong question. And second, don't feel like you need to have an answer right now. You, you really shouldn't. At WNJ, when you arrive here, you're going to do a deep dive into self-discovery before you launch into a major. We wanna make sure that you understand your own aptitudes and gifts and interests and the opportunities available for a person uniquely suited to the world the way that you are. And just because your mom thinks you wanna be a doctor, maybe that, maybe that's not what you really want to do. Maybe you would discover that you'd be better off as a successful artist. And we wanna be sure that we give you that opportunity to really explore yourself deeply before you make those important decisions. The other thing is that we don't let you choose just one major. We require you to choose two areas of study. Um, that way, you're not going to graduate having burrowed um, ever deeper into one groove. Um, you're going to be um, studying in two complementary areas, which means that if your mom really wants you to be a doctor, you can be in the pre-med program, and you can also um, maybe gain another major in, in um, fine arts. So, you know, it... it it fits the liberal arts philosophy of the college very well of, of graduating people who are well-rounded and frankly, people that employers value because of that broader kind of preparation. In terms of the John, future of higher inter- education. I, I got to interrupt, interrupt you only because yeah. what you said is so amazing, right? It's, it's what we all know to be true that a 17 year old, 18 year old being able to pick something like a major that's, that's going to stick with them for however 40, you know what they can't, choose to have a drink or get into a bar legally or do all these other things that have way less impact, but we're expecting these young folks to pick a, a, an area of interest and they barely know themselves. I think it's so amazing what you said there. That uh, well, It is about, unfair, really, isn't it? Yeah. The, well, and of course, the other thing is that a good liberal arts education, um, the way we deliver it, prepares you not just for a single career, but as I said earlier, to be the kind of person who continues to learn and evolve and reinvent yourself going forward. And 
you know, it's important for our students to understand that just because you're graduating with a degree in biology doesn't mean that you've set your course for the rest of your life. It might be that at some point in your career, you find yourself, um, you know, going back to school and becoming a psychologist. I mean, it just, it just really is important for them to not feel like the burden is being placed on them at such a young age to set their course for life and to be afraid that they're, that they're going to, you know, to, to not, to get, to get stuck in something that may not be the right um, career move for them that we're preparing them to, to have many options going forward. You did ask about the future of higher ed. I, um, I tend to be optimistic. I think that we're at a point right now where higher education in our country has been a punching bag for both political parties in many ways. We, we seem to be um, no longer seen as an important pillar of our democratic society that's essential to the the uh, prosperity and success of our country and its form of government. We're, we're viewed too often now as a ticket to a trade and that the, the value of a college degree should be measured solely in terms of lifetime earnings. What do you do then with social workers and school teachers and others who never intended to maximize their earnings? They wanted to do something meaningful with their life. Um, I think we've really narrowed our understanding of what higher education is about. And I think that that uh, we often get blamed for a lot of the ills of society by, by people who don't really understand, you know, what, how the, the U.S. higher education system has not only been the finest uh, higher education system in the world, but it really has been at the foundation of a lot of the success that this country has enjoyed as an economic superpower over many, many, many generations. So that concerns me, but on the other hand, um, you know, while if you if you look at surveys, while you might find that there's a lot of public distrust of higher ed institutions in some quarters, that there are people who question the value of the of a college education and the cost of it, um, you also find in the same surveys that everybody thinks their child should go to college, and for good reason, because we know that a college education leads to better outcomes in life, not just how much money you make but a more satisfying life, a life of, of a greater fulfillment in many ways as well. So I'm optimistic. I don't think people have lost their appetite to become educated. I just think that our institutions have, have uh, borne the brunt of a lot of, in some cases, unfair, maybe in some cases, fair political criticism in, in, uh, in recent years. I also think that there will be a continuing place for these small residential college. We see it all the time. Families come to us um, and prospective students because they understand that for some students, not for everyone, but for some students, this is just the right fit. And when you're choosing a college or university in today's um, environment where it is a bit of a buyer's market, you have a lot of good options. Many places would be happy to admit you. What I tell visiting students and families is that their challenge when they're looking at college is to find the right fit. And for us, the fit is, is going to be for that student who wants to have that in-person, very intimate kind of learning experience in a community where you're known by name, where there are people who make sure that they provide you with the support you need to succeed in every part of your life. I mean, you graduate with a network of people of, of many generations who have a, a fierce loyalty to the institution and to each other and who help each other along in life. I don't think the value of that's going away at all. Um, I don't think we've ever been the right fit for everyone, but I think there are always going to be um, families and, and uh, potential college students who take a look at what's available in the market and ultimately decide that the experience we offer here at colleges like Washington and Jefferson um, is the one that's just right for them. Wow, you said a lot there, John. You said Very a lot well of good said. stuff. Excellent. I love anytime we can have a conversation around higher education and use words like market and student together in the same conversation. It, it really shows the evolution of what is happening in higher education, our understanding of it. And uh, boy, what what an amazing in, uh, 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 episode this was. And I first want to say thank you to my, my co-host, Dr. Bill Pepicella, for coming on yet again. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure. Was, this was a, this was a, a an 
just a, an unbelievably remarkable discussion. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill. By the way, uh, Joe, you did ask me about a song for entrance music. I was going to pin you down, but I'm saying, yeah, well, I, you know, up. I was thinking when I mentioned the 1970s, I thought, you know, our students might not know the song, but when I think about the, the way our college is really dedicated to continuous improvement every single day, that whatever we're doing today is not good enough tomorrow. Um, I think about that Chicago song, Feeling Stronger Every Day. I love it. That's a correct answer, John. Well done. I, I, th I th If that's playing uh, in rooms when you walk in after this episode releases, don't be surprised. And in fact, it might be fun uh, on, to do that on the campus. So thank you again for coming on today, Dr. John Knapp, president of Washington and Jefferson College. We so appreciate your time, John. Thank you for including me. It's been a good conversation. Good questions. And of course, I'm your host, uh, Dr. Joe Salustio here. That was just Bill clapping for me, guys. He's the only one, uh, which is which is fine. Of course, don't forget to review us on our website, www.edupexperience.com. You can go right to reviews. Give us a rating. Give, give us a review. Let us know what you think about this podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. You've just add up. Are you using the right mix of channels to get in front of your audience? Is your messaging personalized and delivered in a medium your audience responds to? Are you spending more time building reports than listening in on what your audience wants? These are not easy questions to answer. That's why our great friends at MDT Marketing are offering a free audit of your marketing efforts. Head to www.mdtmarketing.com slash edup and submit your information for your free consultation today. Look, guys, you got nothing to lose. It's free. I don't know why you wouldn't want a free audit to tell you what you're doing, whether it's effective, and how you can make some incremental changes that can make a big difference moving forward. That's www.mdtmarketing.com slash edup.